Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show that tells you how they made their mark. We have two gentlemen joining us today. First, he's an award winning creative executive, freelance copywriter, and producer. The co author of the novel, Freddie Steinmark Faith, Family, and Football. He was friends and teammates with Freddie, who was a college football player that was diagnosed with bone cancer in his junior year. We welcome in Bauer Yusi. Next, he has coached at Air Force and the U.S. Naval Academy. Currently, the Senior Court Business Development and Sales at PSSI. More importantly, he's the brother of Freddie. We welcome in Sammy Steinmark to the show. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us, Tony. You are welcome. I want to start here with you, Bauer. You guys grew up in Colorado, a suburb of Denver, but tell me and my listeners, how did you meet Freddie? Freddie Freddie and I grew up in the same town and you know, we were little league football players and his dad was the coach and that's really how I met him. And we played together all up through high school. And then he went off to Texas and I didn't. Um, but you know, we, we were uh, in little league sports, uh, football and baseball, and his dad was our coach. And our families were, were very intertwined around our sports. Listeners, if you're not familiar with the name Freddie Joe Steinmark, you will be now and you're in for a treat. Everyone has a story. Freddie's father, Fred, Mother Gloria, and we have Sammy with us. Tell us what it was like growing up in the Steinmark household it was really busy. I mean, uh, Freddie was always playing at least uh, two to three sports. Um, my mother, you know, and dad were devout Catholics. So if we weren't uh, in catechism or Freddie wasn't an altar boy or there wasn't a sporting event going on, our, our whole family pretty much resolved, revolved around Freddie. It was a busy time. It was fun, though. It was like, uh, it was uh, like following Mick Jagger or Elvis Presley around. Sammy, what was the age difference between you and Freddie? We were seven years. I was seven years younger than he was. Is it safe to say then you looked up to Freddie? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say that. Uh, I, I, uh, I kind of thought the sun rose and set on his, on his hind end. You know, he was my whole world. So I guess you would say I looked up to him. A multi-sport star at Wheat Ridge High School, basketball, football, he won the Golden Helmet Award as the best football player in Colorado, but not a single major college football program recruited him. Coach Royal from the University of Texas saw a film and took a chance on Freddie. Tell me, how did Coach Royal find out about Freddie? Coach Royal found out about Freddie because our high school coach, Red Coates, knew Mike Campbell, the defensive coordinator at Texas, and sent him a tape of some of our high school games. And he said, I, I got a couple of kids up here in Wheat Ridge that you guys ought to look at. And it was a pretty foregone conclusion that Texas would really like Bobby Mitchell because he was a you know, 212 pound running back. And I think Bobby was the state shot put champion. You know, great guy. Freddie was a five foot nine, 165 pound guy. He was small, but boy, he was tough. And of course that would come out later. So Mike Campbell looked at the tape and he showed it to Royal and the rest of the coaching staff. And Royal watched about Royal watched about uh, 13 seconds of that tape. And he said, go get that kid. And he was, he meant Freddie. And he said, that is the kind of kid you win championships with. And, and that's, that's really what happened. Uh, and just sort of an interesting thing. University of Colorado said Freddie was too small. Notre Dame, they, they all said he was too small. When they all found out that Texas was after him, then all of a sudden they want, they wanted him, and uh, it was obviously too late. As soon as Freddie went to Texas and interviewed with Royal, it was it was done. He was going there, and that was that. He really wanted to play for Notre Dame. When we were growing up, Notre Dame was his dream. So he was he was pretty crushed when uh, when Notre Dame said, "You're too small to play for us." Speaking of that. How does a kid from Colorado have dreams to play at Notre Dame and for the Chicago Bears? Well, it was it was it was the Catholic thing ah. uh, for Notre Dame. That was God's team. And as far as the Chicago Bears, 
uh, you know, Freddie's mother's maiden name was Marchetti and uh, very Italian. And when you look at the roster of the Chicago Bears, then it was Doug Buffon and all, you know, with all these Italian guys. <laughs> to Freddie, that was like family. So, yeah, he, he, and Willie Gallimore. Sammy, you may remember there's a couple of Chicago players that he, Freddie, just idolized and loved. I'm sure that Gail Sayers was one of them. Brian Piccolo was another one, which is a whole other story. Mm-hmm. With, yeah. uh, with, um, there was Ed Obradovich. He wasn't Italian, but uh, he ate more spaghetti than the rest of the guys. <laughs> <laughs> As you said, Boward, 5'9", somewhere between 150 and 160, an undersized grit player who is actually really humble and would always overcome challenges. Can you guys speak about Freddie's faith and his heart and why that was such so prevalent to him. It, but I want just for a second to go back to that Chicago thing. But if y'all remember, you know, Freddie, we, we talked how tough Freddie was, but you know, the Chicago bears were the monsters on the midway. <laughs> so, you know, if he could play for those monsters, you know, up in Chicago with their attitude of being the big, thug, tough guys, you know, that's how Freddie perceived himself as being that tough guy. So, uh, you know, going going back to the well, I, that was all part of his growing up. Uh, you know, my my parents pretty much told him that uh, anything can be overcome through prayer and your your belief in God. If you you know you, you pray and and stay vigilant and very honest and true to the faith, and you know that was Freddie. You know, Freddie once he decided to get his eyes set on something, it, it was gonna it was gonna happen. He'd come heck or high water, just the way he was. Once he zeroed in on something to where he could focus, you know, that's that's exactly where he was. But you know, Freddie was one of those guys that uh, you know you'd asked earlier about Notre Dame. Well, you know, you through your young life for you to be able to you know be considered by Notre Dame, you had to say a certain amount of rosaries as a kid. <laughs> Freddie said it every day. So uh, that that's that's kind of you know, the way it was, it was, it was his true inner faith that drew him to Notre Dame. It was his true inner faith, you know, that got him through all the tough times of people saying you're too small, but he never, he never let that bother him. And I think that was one of the main reasons that Freddie chose Texas was because Coach Worrell never mentioned his size at one time on his visit. And, uh, you know, and I, I think Daryl saw a little bit in Freddie what he of himself in Freddie, and he says, "This is the kid I want because I've been there. You know, I've done that." And Coach Royal was very intuitive about uh, the kids he recruited, and you know, he just he he fell in love with Freddie's film. That's kind of but it was all a family thing. Is is why I think prayer and the Catholic Church got Freddie through everything. Bauer, on to you with the faith. Tell me and my listeners. The story, in 1966, when you and Freddie went to Davies Chuck Wagon Diner for a burger at 10.30 p.m., and why that's so significant at 10.30 p.m. to go for a burger. Well, and not only uh, the time, but the date. It was the, it was, we we had just played a basketball game, and and oftentimes after our games, Freddie and I would drive around until mid, it was on a Friday night. Catholics couldn't eat meat on Friday. And so we would drive around until midnight when he could have a hamburger. And I was very excited on this particular December date. I want to say it was December 3rd and I might be off by a day or two, but it was the first Friday in a thousand years that the Pope had lifted the ban on eating meat. And I wheeled into Davies Chuck Wagon Diner on West Colfax at 1030 at night. And I said, let's get a burger. And he said, it's not midnight. And I, I looked at him and I thought, how can you not know the band's been lifted? And I said, Freddie, the band's been lifted. We don't have to wait until midnight. And he stared at me like there was something wrong with me. And he said, he lifted the band to make the church more appealing. We're not eating till midnight. And, of course, we drove around until midnight. <laughs> yeah, and and that's just, that is an example of how faithful he was to his faith. And I can tell you that faith guided every single thing he did, whether it was competing, studying, helping his mother, helping his father, helping his brother. It determined everything he did. Kent Clark 
was one of our teammates and Fred and Kent said, you know, if I called Freddie and I said, you want to go uh, drive around or something. And Freddie didn't usually do that. He w- wasn't a kind of guy that would just hang around and, you know, shoot the breeze. <laughs> Kent said he would, he would always have to go to mass before he went anywhere. And Sandy will tell you, I think Freddie went to mass every day of his life, at least, you know, going through uh, when we were growing up. And I, I think he probably did at Texas too, but he had five priorities and, and faith was his first priority. Family was a second priority. Uh, school was a third priority. Sports were fourth. And then everything else came last. I want to paint a picture to my listeners who may not know and try and let them understand the person that Freddie was basically on this earth with a couple of different stories. Bobby Mitchell was a high school and University of Texas teammate slash roommate. Bobby's brother was killed in Vietnam. Freddie was the reason that Bobby got through that. Can either one of you speak to this? Bobby and I were uh, very close also growing up, Tommy. And uh, Bobby had an older brother, Mark, uh, that he he really looked up to, you know, in the same way that Sammy looked up to Freddie. Um, Mark went off to Vietnam, and he was a helicopter pilot. And Bob was in – Bob was – he was struggling a little bit at Texas. You know, Daryl would, he'd bring in every every great running back he could find. And probably some of it was to keep them from going somewhere else. So uh, I think Bob Bob wasn't starting at running back. In fact, he'd been <clears throat> moved to guard. And, you know, so he was a little, he was a little down. And then all of a sudden we get word that, well, Bob got word that his brother's helicopter had been shot down. And his brother had been killed. And it was right before Mark was supposed to come back to the States. It was very crushing to Bob. And part of the reason was uh, Mark was really Bob's family. Uh, And I I really don't know too much about, you know, how close Bob was to his parents, other than I I don't know that his parents really uh, had time or interest in, in watching his sports and stuff. But Mark certainly did. And so this happens to Bob, and there's, you know, the, the campuses are exploding everywhere because of the Vietnam War protests. And, it was, you know, it was, very, it was a very troubling time. And there was Bob in Texas uh, alone, except for his roommate, Freddie. And when, when Freddie walked into the room and he, he realized what had happened, he dropped to his knees immediately and started praying. And he, he really, he helped Bob get through that. And, you know, Bob, Bob talks about that. Uh, I, in fact, I, I had Bob do a little video talking about that. And he, he, he really didn't know how he would have gotten through that time without Freddie. One of the words that comes to mind when I think of Freddie is courage. A role model for not only youth, but adults. The Bobby Dale story and his mother, because again, another example that paints a picture of who Freddie was. Well, do you mean Billy Dale? Billy, back? Yeah, yeah, Billy Dale. I'm sorry. Yeah, he he was another highly recruited back at, at the University of Texas. And a splendid guy. He is still real good friends with him. Also, as most of Freddie's teammates. But um, you know, I think the courage side of Freddie. Freddie always looked at things, and uh, he he was the best boy. He was going to be the honest, you know, beat your fair and square type thing. But he would always be able to, you know. Uh, we would be playing and the older kids would be playing in the lot next door to our house. And, you know, if, when it was time to go eat, if, if Freddie was winning, the game was over. <laughs> if he was behind, it was just half. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, that, that can show you a lot of, of what he was like, but you know, Freddie wasn't scared of the fame because he knew he had God behind him. And he really did. He carried himself with an air of confidence and, um, uh, he wanted to bite off the biggest uh, piece of, of, of whatever he was going after, and he, and he was going to find a way to make it go down. So, a lot of that, a, a lot of his uh, aspirations were he wanted to play big time, and then he wanted to go play for those monsters on the on the midway, and n- nothing scared him, and nothing was going to get in his way. You know that uh, that courage thing help promote him when things happen bad he just he kept on moving like nothing ever happened and uh that's that's just the way that his his whole mentality was 
you know, he and Freddie was the type of guy like when all the cousins that choose upsides and and uh, they'd be playing some type of game, football, baseball, or whatever. We had uh, you know one one cousin Johnny Boy who uh, was struck with uh, really was a polio affliction, I believe, but he had one leg shorter than the other. And uh, Freddie was always you know one of the guys picking, and then anybody else could choose the other team. But every time he chose Johnny Boy first. Uh, to let him know that he was important and he can do it. And Freddie had confidence and faith in him. And that's the kind of thing that Freddie's courage exuded to other people. And they, it was, it was electric. It was, it was something that was just, you just, it, you, you just caught on to it. Everybody around him feel he do that. And the, the big thing, the big thing about Freddie, my dad used to preach all the time. And hey, when you're out playing and messing around with the guys, that's one thing. But you know, when they when they light up that scoreboard, it's time to play for keeps. And don't you ever forget it. And same thing you told me. But so when when they wanted to, there was talk way early that Coach Royal was wanted Freddie's name on the stadium, and my parents, my dad especially, said no. He said one day that's for you or you know, another coach to be named after that stadium coach. And, and the coach, my dad said, but you want to put that scoreboard in his name because that's what Freddie was all about. You light that scoreboard up and he's going to be the first one there. So that was kind of fitting that Texas uh, named their scoreboard forever after Freddie. Yeah. I'm going to get to that part of the scoreboard here in just a little bit. Can you tell me the, the Billy Dale story and, and his mother? Yes. And Billy Dale told me this story, and he hadn't really told anybody about it, I don't think. Uh, he just told me this story a few years ago. Billy Dale really wanted to be a starting running back for the Longhorns. And the day that uh, all of the starters were named, Billy Dale was not named a starter. And when Freddie saw him, he Billy Dale didn't, didn't look like you know he was the happiest guy in the world. And Freddie said, what's the matter? He said, my mother is, is outside the locker room. She's waiting to, waiting to see me. And Freddie said, and? And he said, well, I, I can't go out there and tell her I'm not a starter. I, I really wanted to be a starter. And Freddie said, do you want me to talk to her? And Billy said, yeah, I, I'd appreciate that. And so Freddie went out and he, and he found Billy Dale's mother. And he said, Billy's in the locker room. And, uh, He's, you know, he's, uh, he'll be out here in a bit, but he, uh, he's not going to be a starter, but that's okay because Billy is going to be a very important part of this football team. And he, he's going to play a lot. And, uh, if, if he's not a starter, that's fine. He's, he's still, he's going to be really a major contributor. And just to jump forward, Tommy, you know, Freddie wanted to play for Notre Dame. He was too small, didn't get the chance. And then, lo and behold, Texas beats Arkansas for the national championship, and Notre Dame accepted a bid to come play Texas in the Cotton Bowl. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did that was because they figured, all right, if we go down there and beat Texas, despite the fact we have a few losses, they'll have to name us co-champions. Notre Dame hadn't been to a post-game, a post-season bowl game for 45 years because of the fathers at Notre Dame, so it interferes with the boys' studies. The last time Notre Dame had been in a bowl game, uh, Newt Rockne was their coach, and the four horsemen were in the backfield. So the fact that they're going to play Notre Dame is a huge deal, and Freddie's very excited about that, and I won't jump ahead too much. Uh, but I will tell you that when they played Notre Dame in the Cotton Bowl, it comes down to the winning touchdown was scored by Billy Dale. It's a great story. Freddie, I, Freddie called that the greatest day of his life. Let's start heading that direction. Freddie was the second sophomore ever to be a starting safety for coach Daryl Royals, Texas Longhorn, and part of the 1969 championship team. His last game was versus Arkansas in what was named the game of the century. I know it's been put on into the movies, but you guys have lived this. How noticeable was Freddie in pain, limping? Yeah, that's, uh, um, 
Number one, Freddie never, for some reason, never wanted my mother, especially, or my father, any of the brothers or sisters to worry about him. But I can remember when he first noticed it and talked to his dad about it. We were sitting in the kitchen, my dad and Freddie and I. And um, he had mentioned, you know, the, he asked my dad, you know, when he was playing and he tore cartilage in his knee, what did it feel like and where did it hurt is basically what he asked him. And uh, my dad told him, where here it is. Here's the cartilage. Here's where my pain was. Like, what's going on? And he says, well, you know, I slid into base and he said, I heard a pop. And he says, this thing's been sore, um, much different than a pulled muscle or something. So, but it's, but I know it hurts and I know it's there. And my dad said, you know, we got to get treatment. You got to do this got to do that well anyways he that following summer he was coming through and um his his leg we could tell that he was limping a little bit that it was really giving him some pain but he just said hey i'll go i'm going down early i'm going to meet bill zapalak and some of the guys and we're going to work out a little bit we're going to get ready for the season and i'll go see medina every day so religiously he did get treatment and all that type of stuff but and religiously my dad asked him how he was doing and you know freddie was very honest with my dad but probably you know he didn't want the coaches worry about him he didn't want anything to get in the way of him starting in this season he he that particular season he knew it was going to be pretty special so uh it got to the point where it, it came to the AM game and he took a cheap, cheap shot after returning a punt uh in that thigh area and it was it was super super painful. They didn't we we really didn't know if he was you know going to be able to come back from that. But my dad noticed in that game he kept telling my mom says she's ready to step slow, bro. She, she says he says we got to have him get that leg checked. And so when Freddie called after the game, my dad uh, told him he says Freddie, you promised me after the season that you'd go get that leg checked. And he says I am, Dad. He says uh, it's not getting any better. So, and he had done everything he possibly could to try to make it better because he was bound and determined to play every down. That's kind of how, you know, that all went on. We, we did notice he, it was bothering him that whole season. He played a whole season in excruciating pain. That's the bottom line. Another, another way they noticed it, Tommy, uh, Big Fred, their dad. He would he would watch the games on TV if, if he couldn't get to them, and they got to most of them driving there in the car. Freddie was never was oftentimes not even in the picture when they would you know do a distance shot and you'd see the teams on the field. Freddie wouldn't be in the picture because he was cheating so so far back, uh, you know, to keep people from getting behind him. And and uh, I that's when your dad noticed also, Sammy. He said he's he, something is really wrong with that leg. Here's another thing about Freddie though. He he played with pain like nobody you could ever imagine when we were in high school. He played a half a game, half a football game on a broken leg, and then when we were seniors, biggest game of our lives, he's got a broken bone in his hand, and nobody he doesn't tell anybody about it. He just he pain just didn't stop him, and so I think part of the part of the reason that uh, Texas and everybody, uh, you know, they allowed him to work at his own pace and everything because they knew. On game day, he was going to show up, and you know Fred Aker said that too. He said, "Well, we just we kind of let him run his own ship." Did he then really hide how bad his leg was from Coach Royal until after the Arkansas game? He well, I tell you, here's the whole deal. He he didn't want to miss a down, and uh, you know Fred is a very smart guy. He had to have known that whatever was bothering his leg was pretty serious and i think that he uh he didn't want to he didn't want to jeopardize being able to play right through the season when it finally got to the point that he had to go talk to frank medina that's i mean it, he, he had reached the end of the line if he could have if he could have just gone another couple of weeks and played against notre dame that would have been his dream but uh right he had a tumor in his thigh bone that I understand was so large that an inch of his femur had been devoured by cancer. The doctors didn't know how he was walking, let alone playing football, which speaks volumes to what you guys have already talked about on Freddie's behalf. His left leg was amputated. 
Bauer, I understand when he came to after the amputation, was he already talking about one-legged kickers? Yes. He, uh, first of all, he asked Father Bomar, his priest down there, to be in the room with him when he came out of uh, the surgery. He says, I, I don't, if I've lost my leg, I don't want my mother and father to have to tell me that. So will you be in there? And Bomar said yes. And um, so, so you know, when he came to, he, he asked Father Bomar, and Father Bomar said, well, you, you know, it's, you've lost your leg. And very shortly after that, when he was still in and out, being lucid and then gone, he wanted to know if there was any rule in the NCAA about one-legged kickers. <laughs> he, uh, you know, I mean, that's how focused he was, I guess. I mean, it's so hard for me to imagine being the athlete he was, to, you know, just at the top of the mountain and then to wake up and you've lost a leg. I, it just, even today, I think about this and get teary. It's, the, here's one thing I can speak about the courage. And Sammy put it beautifully just a little bit ago. But 20 days after his surgery, he's on the sideline at the Cotton Bowl versus Notre Dame and surprises the team in the locker room. What did he have to go through to get himself even be able to get to the Cotton Bowl after having his leg amputation? Sammy was there with him. Well, it it all started where uh, my two sisters and myself weren't able to be with him the day they amputated it, but uh, four days later, we were there. So we had to get tickets, and and uh, Father Bomar and my dad picked my sisters and I up at the airport. And you know, it was one of those situations where I just wasn't used to not being with Freddie through everything from doctor's appointment when he broke his leg, you know, his hand, everything that ever happened to Freddie. You know, I was there, and uh, in the training rooms and the doctor's offices, you know, his whole life, and so. I just, um, I was very concerned because I, we weren't be, weren't able to be down for the surgery. So we were uh, the Mayfair Anderson across the street from MD Anderson, and we spent that Christmas there. But as, as all Freddie could do was, I mean, he was pretty much, the doctors were coming in and said, hey, well, you, we're going to start here. We're going to do this. We're going to go slow. You've had a very traumatic surgery. And uh, Freddie says, I don't have time to go slow. And uh, and they said, well, what do you mean? And he told the, the doctor, Dr. Morton, I think it was, he says, he said, well, I got to be ready to go. I got to be at the game, you know, the Cotton Bowl game against Notre Dame. And he says, oh, Freddie, there's no way you're going to be there. And he says, you'll be still recovering. And uh, through all that time, Freddie mastered his crutches, um, in fact, one day they were taken into the Houston Zoo, believe it or not, and uh, the, the doctor, Dr. Healy, who was his, uh, basically the doctor that uh, re- rehabilitates the, the patients, and uh, we they were talking about, uh, he was just learning to get in and out of the car with his crutches, and he told Freddie, he says, Freddie, he says, you know, uh, Maybe maybe your brother Sammy ought to sit this one out. He says, just in case you fall or something happens, and we got to get you back here in a hurry to the hospital. And he said, he says, okay, but he says, I don't know. So I figured out where they were teaching him to get in and out of that car that was down below um, in MD Anderson on the wing. And I could see them. What I did is they had those rollout windows with the metal lining around the window, if you remember those. And uh, I rolled it out and hung out the window across my elbows and kind of hung out and was watching him. And the doctor said, there's somebody jumping out of the window at the hospital. He said, you better go get <laughs> somebody. Go get that person's kid suicide. <laughs> and he starts to go happen. And he says, doc, he says, I told you. I said, you better let him come with us or he won't kill himself trying. <laughs> so they came and got me. We went to the zoo. And had ice cream cones, and uh, and so you know, Freddie, Freddie's whole attitude for that you he just he took it on like learning a new position, or just like when Coach Royal told him, said Freddie, you know, you're going to be calling the signals, you're going to be the first sophomore starter on our defense, and Tommy Novus, and Tommy was probably and notably the greatest player Daryl ever coached, 
And so to be in that realm, Freddie had to live the part in his mind. So he had to show that courage and toughness backed by the Lord and get the opportunity to be, you know, talked about in the same breath as Tommy Novus. That was a big deal down in Austin, very big deal. And so um, he just he just took everything in stride and was going to conquer it, you know, no matter what. And uh, that's kind of that's kind of the way he looked at all that. But he mastered his crutches uh, at, at that point, getting in and out of cars. Cars, and then we went to the Astrodome, and they had a big deal there for him, and lit up the scoreboard, you know, with his name and everything on it, and welcomed him, and, and so. You know, he got he got out for there, and we, we would go on walks and different stuff, and to the rehab centers. I I would go in and follow him in there, and it was very painful for him, but he he just kept that unbelievable smile on his face and just kept right on ticking like a time that she couldn't do anything to him. It was that was going to hold him back. He's going to find a way, and so uh, he he actually got to the point where the doctor said, okay. Well, I was pretty upset because I wasn't able to fly with him to the Cotton Bowl. They they had a, a jet reconfigured it. It basically was a mini operating room. They had plasma. They had doctors and surgeons just in case he were to fall and test that pop that incision open under under where they amputated his leg, his hip. There's a lot of stitches down there, and a lot of things could have happened. So we I, we took another plane as a family, but as soon as he got there, I would, they said, "You wait here. The limo's going to take Freddie." And I think it was a a Ewing airplane, wasn't it, Bauer? Yes, it was. Mister Ewing uh, actually did that for the plane, and and got Freddie there. And I met him when they pulled up to the stadium. And we walked in to the locker room together, Freddie and Father Bomar and I, and uh, it was it was a uh, that was something that. You, you only get one shot at in life, and man, I, I thought I was there. <laughs> so. Coach, you know, uh, Coach Royal uh, said, you know, he said we really didn't prepare the team uh, for Freddie. He said, you know, there's just some things that you you just let them happen. And when Freddie came into the locker room, uh, I mean, you can just imagine what an emotional thing that was, and yet it was. Uh, like guys just started talking to him and it was, you know, here's Freddie. And I don't think anybody made a big deal out of it except that there were two shoes in his locker. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about this story where there are two shoes or one shoe. Uh, but you know, uh, Freddie went to his locker and, uh, was, was part of the team and that's what he wanted. And of course the team went out and warmed up and then Freddie, went down the tunnel and uh, with Sammy and Father Bomar on either side of him. And when he entered the stadium, um, place went nuts. You know, nobody, nobody could believe he was 21 days after uh, losing his hip. Uh, and all the doctors said that's never going to happen. Uh, and yet what Freddie did was basically rewrite all the protocols. You know? mm-hmm. uh, not just for cancer treatment, but for recovering from uh, an amputated limb. I'm going to tell you a short, interesting story. I was in Houston uh, for a book signing, and uh, it was right after Thanksgiving. And it's all done, and you know people are you know packing up and leaving. And this woman rushed into the bookstore with, with a man, and she had the book under her arm, and she said, "Am I too late?" And I said, uh, "Would you would you like me to sign the book?" And she said, "Yes, I." I was sitting at my coffee table, my breakfast table this morning, and I saw that you were here, and I had to come. And uh, I said, "Did you did you go to school with Freddie at Texas?" And she said, "No." Um, uh, when this happened, um, I was ten years old, and Daddy was his surgeon. And she said, "Daddy came home from work one night, and we sat around the table, and she said, my father was not an emotional man.'" And uh, he he started crying, and we we were my siblings and I were startled. What was this about? And he said that he that day he had been a boy, and uh, it was it was so so awful. 
what what was happening to this boy. And she said, you know, I, I've never forgotten that as long as I've lived. And so that's why I wanted to come here and say hi. And her her name is Giggy. So I'm I'm guessing she went to Texas A and M. But uh pretty pretty remarkable, pretty pretty powerful. I wanted to tell you one more thing too, Tommy, um about Freddie's uh leadership. When he uh he got injured and couldn't play, uh his replacement and I'll fix that in a second, was Rick Neighbors. <clears throat> and when I talked to Rick the first time, I said, so now I understand that you were Freddie's replacement. And he said, well, no, we're going to stop right there. I stepped in for Freddie. Nobody could replace Freddie. Mm. And he said, the thing that I, I learned about Freddie very early on, Freddie and I played the same position. And then beginning of the year, everybody's working real hard and trying to, you know, make the team and not just make the team, but become a starter. And this guy, Freddie, is telling me how to do things so that I can do them better. Or he's, you know, he's explaining little angles and things that I can take to get to the ball faster. And I kept thinking to myself, this guy and I are competing for the same position and he's doing everything he can to help me win the position. Uh, I'll never forget that. And that, that, you know, he wanted everybody, Freddie, Freddie brought everybody up to his level. I mean, it, there's no other way to explain that. I got to tell you a little bit about, no matter the controversy about the shoes, but when they had the whole locker dressed out for Freddie and him and I were sitting there and, um, I looked at you, Freddie, look, they got all your stuff here. They got your helmet, new, a game jersey. I said, look, they, there's your shoes. And, and I said, but, you know, let's just say there were two of them. And I said to him, he had two shoes there. And he goes, well, it doesn't look like I'm going like to need the other one. I does it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, just in stride. You know, was, here's a guy that just had his leg amputated. Uh, uh, without a doubt, probably one of the best defenders in the country. I'm the best team in the nation. And all of a sudden, they tell you you can't play. And he says, well, I guess it just looks like I'm not going to need that other shoe now, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, a great sense of humor. Great oh, sense of humor. Unbelievable. So after he had lost his leg, he was in the swimming pool working out one day. <laughs> Some of his teammates saw him, and they said, uh, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm you know, working out. And they said, uh, why don't you go out for the swim team? <laughs> Freddie said, they don't have any circular races. <laughs> i'm gonna put a link in the show notes to freddyjoesteinmark.com where you can check out the site you can also get your hands on the book i'm also going to put a link to a video to when coach royal awarded freddie the game ball after the cotton bowl and i'll let you guys watch that at your own i'm not going to get into it now what i want to learn from you guys is and probably more sammy than bauer in the year and a half after his amputation, what was Freddie like? What was he doing? Did he finish his senior year? What happened from the Cotton Bowl until basically when he got to the point where, you know, he just was in and out of a coma around in May of 71? So it was what happened after um, the Cotton Bowl. Uh, they had fitted Freddie with his prosthesis. Okay. And it was very uncomfortable because it was right you know, Freddie didn't have a leg all the way up to his hip. So they had to put a lot of weight on him back then and try to take the pressure off of the, where the incision was and those type of things. But for the banquet, when was the banquet, Bauer? Was it like February 2nd or something like yeah, that? It was about 12 days after the game. So it was yeah. January. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, Freddie mastered that leg in 12 days and walked across the stage to receive his letter for letter to put on his letter jacket for that year. And, uh, I mean, that was just, that was just unheard of at the time. And, uh, so he just, he went from there, he in, enrolled in lots of classes. Uh, I think he wanted to, uh, get his LSATs out of the way, but he was also an, an engineering major. So he, he was studying and, you know, everything, you know, was going pretty good. He was feeling pretty decent until they, he had checkups and here's how it went as he came home. And Freddie said, hey, I'm going to bring Sammy down to Austin with me for the summer. He said, I, I think he'll have fun doing that. We'll go to watch baseball games and football practice and go around the guys. And he'll have a, he'll have a big time doing all that. So I said, you know, can I go, Mom? And my dad said, absolutely. <laughs> so 
I didn't have to take my finals that year uh, of, of when I was in school. And uh, so we left like, uh, oh, it was April 1st or 2nd, something like that. And we took off and drove down to Texas and, you know, got there and we stayed in Father Bomar's factory and he learned to water ski. He was taking Portuguese. Uh, he was uh, taking the Russian seven or whatever it was. He was darn near fluid in Russian and, and, and French, but he was taking Portuguese and piano lessons. And so I got to go with him on a lot of that stuff. And, you know, after he would go to class, or whatever, we'd go to lunch. And I mean, it, and it didn't matter where we went. There was 10, 15, 20 people wanting his autograph, coming over to talk to him, you know, say hi. And uh, I can remember going to a Whataburger. <laughs> it was, they were just opening up at the time. And, and uh, there were pictures and people taking pictures. And they said, who's that with you, Freddie? And he says, oh, the original Whataburger boy. <laughs> so he, you know, he always had something to where he was going to, you know, make light. Well, I can remember listening to him talk on the uh, phone to my mom and dad and said, you know, I've got to drive to Houston and I'm going to, uh, Sammy's going to stay with the Greers, who was a family that had little boys and, and also Joel Levy, who owned Rice Food Market. And um, they were in Houston. So I stayed a week there and a week with the other family. Well, at that time, Freddie went to get all this test done. I didn't get to go with him during all that time, which I, I and I can understand why Freddie didn't want all that there. But uh, so they did find the nodules in his lung at that time. And uh, so he had to tell my parents what was going on. And he he basically said, OK, you know, they they had an option for him to go under surgery and, and then take all those nodules out of his lung. Or, you know, Freddie just says, I'm just don't want them cutting on me anymore. I'm tired of this. I'm going to if this if it's time for me to go with the Lord, it's going to happen. But he said, I'll do everything else possible. So he was taking, you know, all kinds of different chemos to try to knock that out of his lung at, at the time. And uh, so it, you know, it made him lose his hair and get really, really sick. And so then it was time for me. I had to come back for my two days for my football team in high school. So I had left. And then he took even more regiments down in Houston for that. And he still went around and he, he spoke for different people with Bob Lilly and uh, some, uh, some other cowboys, Walt Garrison and fellowship of Christian athletes. He did a lot of different speaking engagements that a lot of people didn't even know about. But, everybody wanted, everybody wanted to be near Freddie and he was invited all over the country. People were calling, can you come speak to us? It, it just, it's so many groups and he, he satisfied a lot of them. Uh, and somehow still went to school. He changed from chemical engineering to law, uh, but he was he was able to do a lot of that speaking. And uh, just as far as when the when the nodules showed up, he had become uh, pen pals with Brian Piccolo. Brian mm -hmm. Piccolo sent him a letter after the game of the century and said, "I watched you play, and uh, probably I alone." know know what you're going through and because piccolo was in the hospital then wow and uh, you know and he he basically said you know so we uh i don't have the letter in front of me but it, it's a beautiful letter it's in the book actually and he said you know we our 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 uh, fate is in god's hands now and um uh, so Freddie knew, in fact, when, when he was driving back with Father Balmar from the day that he found out that the nodules had come back, he, he said, well, I, I know, I know I need to go home now. Take me back to Houston. I need to fly home and talk to my parents. Uh, you know, he, the last 17 months of his life were, um, really such a contribution to, to humanity, uh, he just he didn't sit back and feel sorry for himself or anything. He just you know he he changed his focus. He you know went from chemistry into law, and he he became very uh, more than ever service oriented, helping people. And so that's why he you know he spoke everywhere and somehow still managed to go to school. And and he didn't he didn't graduate. He didn't have enough credits to graduate. And uh, Unfortunately, he's, he's such a smart guy. I mean, 
you know, Lord knows what he would have become in in life, but uh, it would have been would have been fantastic. When he when he got back to Houston, they, they Coach Earl called into his office with David McWilliams and Coach Campbell, and they asked him to be in a, a, a student coach. So Freddie helped coach secondary, and he would go with uh, Coach McWilliams, uh, who ended up being the head coach at Texas later on down the line, decade or so after. And uh, he would go scout the opposing team that's coming up the next week. And him and David McWilliams became pretty good friends. Uh, uh, instead of a coach-player relation, he coached the backers. And, uh, you know, coach, coached the secondary guys. So it was a it was kind of a cool deal that they, that they asked him to coach, which he did. It's also important, Tommy, we, we've got to uh, tell you that Fess Parker and his son Eli – went to the game of the century and they met Freddie there. And then subsequent to that, everything, you know, goes crazy with the diagnosis. And it, it turned out in, uh, later in 1970, um, Fess Parker and Freddie and Father Bomar were the guests of President Nixon at the White House. And Freddie became the spokesperson for the American Cancer Society. And uh, they did a seven-minute film, and on that film, Freddie talks about, you know, his hope for, you know, cancer research is to, you know, someday uh, we can cure this, and you don't have to lose an arm or a leg or an organ or or die. Pretty powerful watching that. Um, so he became the spokesperson for the American Cancer Society, and um, at Freddie's funeral, President Nixon sent a personal representative who uh, was actually Bud Wilkinson's son, I think, Jay Wilkinson. And he pulled Freddie's mother aside and he said, uh, the president asked me to ask you if there's anything he can do to comfort you. And she said, well, tell him to fight cancer like he fights all these other wars. And so Congress, subsequent to that, got very busy and wrote the legislation for the National Cancer Act of 1971, which Richard Nixon signed into law on December 23rd, big ceremony, and that that began President Nixon's war on cancer. Freddie had a profound effect on all of us. Uh, you know, I mean, he changed the way we talk about cancer. He changed so much about it. He passed away on June so, 6th, 1971. Buried in Colorado. Whatever happened to Freddie's girlfriend, Linda Wheeler? She's, uh, well, obviously they didn't get married. You know, I, I get emails from people all the time, Tommy, from really from all over the world. And that is one of the first things they always want to know is what happened to Linda? Did they get married? Did they have kids? And no, and no. And, you know, she, she eventually married, um, I just saw her at uh, a reunion a few years ago, and, and she looks great and uh, was was delighted that, uh, you know, the Steinmarks had, had asked to have this book written. And, um, you know, one of the things to remember is it, when this all happened, everybody was very young. Freddie's mother was only 40 years old when all this happened. I mean, we it- were we were all. Teenagers. Yeah, so. everybody was so young. The reason I was asking the question of what happened to Linda was because everybody was so young and this was such a traumatic experience, I could see where this could pull them apart. I didn't know if she stuck by his side throughout all this or if it was just too much for her to overcome and they just kind of drifted apart. She, she uh, stuck around and uh, Freddie ended up asking me, uh, her to marry him. And, uh, and, and so that, you know, he got engagement rings and that type of stuff. Cause he, he was not going to admit that the game was over. Mm. I mean, it was just halftime again. And, uh, and that was part of his mentality in the picture that I'm trying to paint for you on that, you know, if he's winning, <laughs> the game's over. If it's not, it's halftime. <laughs> we we got to finish the game <laughs> till I'm winning. <laughs> and cancer was, he looked at cancer the same exact way. And, uh, and I and I believe that that was the the situation for that, but you know it uh, it it came down to uh, Freddie just got so so sick so fast that 
it it just it just didn't you know they couldn't do anything right. to slow it down. He wasn't well enough to get out of the hospital and and get married, and so you know it never happened. And uh, still stayed in touch with Linda a lot. I haven't talked to her in a while, but uh, still stay in touch with her, and and uh, she's uh, she's doing well as far as I know. So that's that's kind of that that saga, you know. Of Freddie was, you know, in his lifetime. Listeners, let me paint you a picture of how Freddie's been remembered, not just at UT, but at his high school. At the University of Texas, there's a pillar. His legacy lives on as his photo with the word heart flashes on the Freddie Steinmark scoreboard that Sammy spoke about prior to each home game. The scoreboard was named after him on September 23rd, 1972, and rededicated to him on November 7th, 2015, as the team wore the 1969 throwback uniforms versus Kansas. His number 28 was worn by cornerback Duke Thomas, and at Wheat Ridge High School, he's remembered in various ways from the Freddie Steinmark Way, Steinmark Hall, and the Steinmark Award for the student athlete that has excelled. My question to you guys then is this, is it football or is his leg amputation that had the bigger impact? Well, you know, that's a great question, Tommy. Uh, never thought about that. I, I think it's, um, and Sammy, you know, you, you jump in if you want to. I just think it's the way Freddie lived his life. Um, we all have challenges uh, and things to overcome. Uh, you know, not, not all of us lose a leg and have to overcome something that, that terrible. Um, but we have, our, we have our problems. And I, I just think it's the way Freddie lived his life the values he held, um, people remember him for that. I, I, when you say Freddie Steinmark, I, I think obviously probably people remember uh, the tragedy of losing his leg, but it, it's just a, such a much bigger picture. The, the Fred Steinmark Award is given to the top boy and girl senior in Colorado every year. Uh, on the basis of their athletic performance, their scholastic performance, and their their citizenship, and uh, the the Colorado High School Coaches Association is the one that presents the award. And uh, they said it's it's almost impossible every year to pick the top boy and the top girl because the the the, the nominees are so outstanding, and uh, no no one has ever disgraced the award. There's been 54 boys and 51 girls now. And the reason there's uh, a few uh, fewer girls is because of the first first two years of the award, only boys got it. And then Mr. Steinmark went to them and said, you know, uh, and this was right around Title IX time, too. He said, girls are competing just like boys. I mean, girls should be able to win this award, too. And so then they said, okay, we're going to have uh, we'll have an award for the girls and an award for the boys. So, And Dave Logan who is the voice of the Denver Broncos now and a tremendous athlete. He was, he was drafted by uh, baseball, basketball, and football in high school. Uh, he, went to, uh, he went to University of Colorado, ended up playing in Cleveland, and I think he played a year with the Broncos after that. Um, but uh, he was the first award winner. He was the first winner of that award. He wrote his autobiography, I Play to Win. What happened to that? Uh, well, I can tell you that um, it was written urgently. Uh, Little Brown published it. And, you know, they wanted to get the book out right away because, you know, Freddie didn't have a, a long time to live. And Blackie uh, Sherrod was a Dallas uh, sports writer who helped Freddie write it. And Freddie was very sick, Tony, and he was, he really was unable to do much. And so uh, we found a letter one day from, I, I'm probably saying things I shouldn't say, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, little Brown was, you know, getting a little impatient and, and Blackie responded to them, look, he, he's very sick. I'm, I'm having to, you know, make a lot of this up. I mean, it's, you give me a break. And uh, in so many words. And so when, Mrs. Steinmark got a copy of the book. Freddie never had a chance to prove it. No, no one in the family did. 
when she finally got a copy of the book, she opened it up and read, I think, two pages and closed it, never looked at it again. And she said, that's not my son. And so the book was never printed again. Um, and when, you know, when we decided to write this biography, she said, I, I really want people to know who Freddie was. And if they just watch the movie My All-American, they won't know it. Um, you know, Hollywood Hollywood does things with stories. And, um, well, they did a pretty good job with My All-American. But, you know, there's some things that, you know, like Sammy is not even in the movie. And really, Sammy and Freddie were inseparable for Freddie's whole life. So um, that's why that's why I play to win. Uh, nothing ever really happened to it after that first printing. Hey, Bauer, something just came to me because the book, Freddie Steinmark, Faith, Family, and Football, that you wrote with Tom Cryan, and you were asked to write that by Sammy's mother. You grew up with Freddie. Did you have any reservations about writing this? Oh, I did. Absolutely. Um, what, what, what flipped it that you said, okay, I'll write it. I, well, I, well, I went to Denver and I talked to them and I came home and I, I said to my wife, I, I can't do this. And she said, why not? And I said, I, it's Freddie. It's uh, it's a huge story, and I I don't want to fail him. I, I don't know if I can do it. And I'll I'll just tell you this because this is what happened. I was standing in my kitchen looking out the window, and all of a sudden the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I looked over at my refrigerator, and there was Big Fred standing there. Now he died in two thousand. He, he was standing there, and he walked right up to my face, and he said, you can do this. Just do it. And I, I was like, oh, my God. I immediately called the Steinmarks, and I, I said, something unbelievable has happened. And I was talking to one of Sammy's sisters, and she said, what? And I said, I just, I, I, had, a, I had a very strange experience, but I'm telling you, your dad was just in my kitchen. And she said, what was he wearing? And I said, well, he had on a, a, a black kind of a leather blazer and a, a few khaki pants. And I'd never seen him wearing that when we were growing up. And she starts crying and screams for her mother. And she says, oh, my God, <laughs> that's what he wore all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said, I, I'll, I can do it. I'm going to do it. And that really was, unless that had happened, Tommy, I, I don't think I would have done it. I really, I was scared. I was scared to fail. Let me end on this. What is Freddie's lasting impression being his story is still being told 52 years after he passed away? You know, I'll tell tell you what, um, probably need to go back a couple of seconds here on this before before the end of it. And that that you asked the question, uh, is it was it Freddie's playing prowess or how he handled cancer? Did people remember him by the most? Is, was that your question? Yeah, was it football or his leg amputation that had the bigger impact? Let, let, for, I'll handle that first, and I'll tell you one quick second because this leads in right to what you're talking about. Um, I'm one of those guys from being a coach <laughs> all my life. Is that uh, I'm not a believer in single causation. So when you ask a question like that about a guy like Freddie, you know, I used to nickname Freddie TP a long time ago because he was the total package. He wasn't total paper, but uh, he, there was just, he was the total package. His, the way he carried himself, what he believed in. And, uh, you know, he, it was everything about him. It was his football. And, and a lot of times because he was, such great faith that his football took a back seat to that. But he he was one of the best. He had the best anticipation, and he was the t- one of the toughest guys on the team. And that Coach Campbell says, he says, I've never been able to play with a free safety that was like having another Mike linebacker standing out on the field. You know, so you know, Freddie you know, hit like a linebacker and could cover anybody, including Jerry Levias or wh- whoever it might have been or, uh, you know, with uh, with some of the worst pain somebody could probably play with in their life, he did pretty good against Chuck Dykus and the and the Razorbacks for what he was going through, and uh, and his brains and his 
field awareness and his anticipation is what got him through that, uh, that game defensively in his position. So, you know, Freddie's kind of, you know, if you ever, if you ever thought about, you know, I, I love cherry pie, right? And sometimes I don't get it for six or seven months and I just crave it and can't wait till, you know, you cut that cherry pie up and you take a piece of it. And then a little while later, you might have two or three and somebody asks you, well, what piece of that pie was the best for you? Well, how do you say the first one was better than the second or the third was better than the first? You know, that that's just kind of, that's just kind of the way, you know, you look at Freddie's life and that he was here for such a short amount of time. And again, it, Freddie wasn't a single causation guy. He had so many great things going about him that he always, he always looked at life as this is where I'm going to end up, not where I am. I think part of that legacy is, is, is because his life was so short. And, uh, one of the messages is that it, and this was always true of him too, it, everything you do matters. It, it, he just, he never wasted time. He wasn't a, he wasn't a small talk guy, a gossiper. He just, whatever he did, it had some purpose for somewhere he was trying to get to. So, uh, you know, life is short, but you, you, you can do what you want to do if you just do it. Well, and I can remember the last things we talked about before he went to MD Anderson's the last time he was sick, throwing up blood. I mean, it was a terrible scene at our house, and my mom and dad got him on a plane to MD Anderson. My mom went with him to to go see the doctors in MD Anderson the last time I saw him. And I said, Ray, I said, you know, everything you do, everything you touch turns out great. It's just everything about you is greatness. I said, how do you, how do, you do it? I said, how could I do that? And he said, well, then Scott, he says, says, you know, he said, success is never, never, ever calibrated or, or, or looked upon the same because he said, you know, true success is not how big a house you have or how many Mercedes you got in your garage or how thick your wallet is. The true greatness is taking all of the attributes that God has given you, you develop them to the utmost to help other people. Now you're successful. The website is freddyjoesteinmark.com. Bauer, Sammy, thank you guys so much for your time coming on and really getting in deep on who Freddie was, what his legacy is. I greatly appreciate this conversation. I know my listeners are going to love this show. So thank you guys for everything. Can I uh, do a quick plug for the audio book? Absolutely. Uh, it's just come out. And uh, the reason I want to you know, bring it to your attention and to your listeners' attention, uh, it, it, it's Freddie Steinmark Faith Family Football, and we did an audio book version of it, which I narrate. Sammy reads all of Freddie's words. So Sammy is Freddie's voice in this book. Pretty powerful. And we added a lot of historical audio clips to to the book that really put you in the moment, uh, whether it's President Nixon or Howard Cosell or Reverend Billy Graham. I mean, the the clips are in there. And when you when you hear these things, it just boy, it puts you right there. It's available on Audible and, you know, all the audio booksellers. Can they also get it from the website that you have, Bauer? Uh, I think we've set that up. I'm not 100% positive, but I think so. And uh, there's a there's a five minute uh, sample of the book if you get on one of the sites and listen to it. It gives you a pretty good idea of what you're going to get. I'll put a link to all that. Bauer, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tommy, very much. Sammy, thank you for your time and and coming on and talking about your brother. Thank you, Tommy. Can't wait to meet you. Same here. That's going to do it for this episode of Before the Lights. But before I go, listeners, do me a favor and take 30 seconds out of your time. That's all this is going to take you. Click five stars and leave me some nice comments on the platform that you're listening to this for me so I can continue to grow my podcast. Until next time, everybody, a salute, a chin chin.